Happy Friday, everybody. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over two decades of experience as a painter, a craftsman, a colorist, lover of homes to answer any of your questions, whether you're a homeowner or a pro. Homeowners, what have you always wanted to ask a pro? Uh, pros, we can talk business, marketing, accounting, entrepreneurship, apprenticeship, whatever you like. This is a forum for it, for uh, the two sides to exchange some ideas. So, today we are in New Ulm, lovely New Ulm, about an hour and 15 minutes away from my home. We are on one of the most beautiful estates in New Ulm. Uh, this is a, uh, an estate up on the hill, the main house here. There's another wash house behind it. And they actually have a horse that's grandfathered into the city, city limits here. We're in the middle of the town. Uh, there's a horse barn and a fence right over there, and they have a very old horse that lives there. So this is always a fun one. Uh, Bobby and Charlie are awesome hosts. We come here every year to do some restoration work on their, on their estate here. Uh, and we're always grateful to be here. Now, today we're gonna talk about a couple things. I got a question, uh, the PDCA contractor question of the week is about my daily production process. How do we actually manage what happens between eight to four or six to four? And then there's a question about how to paint chalky surfaces. And these guys are not the audience, they are my apprentices. And this is the first time I've ever had one of you guys on. Yes, no? Yep. Yeah, okay. So I'm taking a big risk here. Don't say anything stupid, all right? <laughs> not that Mind bad. your P's and Q's, all right. <laughs> So I thought I would show you, instead of describing it, I thought I would show you what I actually do almost every day when we start a project. So we're, we're at the homeowner's job site. We get inside the house. We're gonna use an interior project uh, as an example today. I gather up all the apprentices and we line up in order of least seniority to most seniority. I start off with the least experienced uh, apprentice I have and I ask them, what they would do during the day and this is kind of what it looks like so we have three bedrooms to paint just walls simple patch the cracks two coats right over the top it's standard the most vanilla interior painting we can have nate what's the first thing we do first thing we do is we're going to move any furniture to the middle away from the walls we're going to drop down we're going to set up our job site we're gonna set up our job site so it's okay. in an advantageous spot. Our and work then, area, yep. yep. And uh, after that, we're gonna take anything off the walls. We're gonna do our our patching and caulking if need be. Yep. And then uh, we'll go ahead and tape. And then on from there, we'll we'll do our first coat. Okay. Um, obviously, second coat follows. How would you modify that process? Um, job site first. Job site. Yep. Job site then. Um, moving furniture and drop furniture, cloth. Drop cloth. Yep. Um, and then next would be patching. Patching. Um, patching, taping. Taping while the patch is dry. Yep. yep. Um, and caulking while we patch if, if we need it. If needed. Yep. <clears throat> um, and then, yeah, we said tape. And then sanding patches. Sanding patches. Yep. Um, and then, I guess, with, along with taping was masking so all plastic and everything that needs yep. to be yep. involved with that. But yeah, and then first coat. First coat, second coat, and then? And then clean up. Clean up. Yep. One thing these two missed, what is it? I was gonna get nay, but Sam got it, sanding, sanding patches. Something else. While we're waiting for patches to dry. Wait. Switch plates. Oh yes, yeah. yep. The catch-all, okay, so, <laughs> and remember, it's, we usually go eight to four in the winter here for that. So it's eight o'clock now. What time do we have to have all the prep done in order to get our work done today? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. So that gives us three hours for prep, and then that gives us how many hours for top coat, how many hours for second coat? Including lunch. Including lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Two for each coat, yeah. Two hours for each coat. Yeah. Okay, so we got eight to 11 prep. Whatever, whatever is prepped and ready to go at 11, we have to start top coating. So then 11 to one, our first coat must be done. One to three, our second coat must be done. Then that gives us an hour to basically clean up. Uh, in the cleanup, what are the things that we do that most other people don't do? Vacuum. Vacuum, sweep. Vacuum, sweep yep. Dust clean down up. the hard surfaces, yep. move furniture, check with the homeowner, see what needs to be moved. Yep. Okay, and then obviously clean it up, back ourselves out, organize the truck and home. All right, sound good guys? Sounds good. Okay, that's it, back All to right. work now. Will do. All right, so 
basically every day that's what we do we start the day whether it's an exterior exterior varies a little bit the interior is a, is a bit more quantified so uh, there's there's set times during the day where we uh, uh, you know with my experience I can usually break off a chunk of interior something uh, that will get prepped and fully ready to go by 11 uh, we're usually not too surprised by that but once in a while there'll be some extra prep and we'll just have to modify what we expect to do that day so um, uh, if you guys have any questions about that, type it down below there. Exterior, would everyone is a little bit different. Uh, we have to play uh, dew in the morning. We have to play uh, sides of the house with sun, whether we're brush roll spraying, things like that. I thought the interior would be easier to quantify for you. So uh, I will scroll through these questions, uh, and I will uh, answer any of those that you have after this next question. Uh, somebody was wondering about um, how do I paint extremely chalky surfaces? Uh, primers, tools, processes, is there a way to test for chalkiness? Uh, and I have a very good answer for this one. There's, there's some times where you can say, well, that's your way of doing it, that's your way of doing it, but honestly, there, there's a lot of products out there, both coatings and additives, that say basically, well, listen, if you got this, horrib this horribly failing surface and it's got a bunch of chalk on it, dump a little of this in here and everything will be good. Uh, do not do that. Uh, if you read the fine print or the technical data sheets of a lot of these products, what you'll find is that it must be overly a properly prepped surface. So here's the deal with chalky surfaces. Uh, I just did a gas station in a surrounding town of to mine. 20 to 30 year old uh, pre-finished metal siding. Number one, wash. Uh, and for this particular project, uh, I usually use a combination of uh, TSP and Simple Green. Depending on what kind of chalk it is, I do a little test patch. But we take a pump sprayer, like a garden sprayer, uh, put TSP additive, you know, mixed in with water or some simple green, uh, spray it on the building, we agitate it with brushes, and then we pressure wash it off. I find that that combination will remove 99% of all chalk. I haven't found a horribly chalky surface yet where that doesn't prep it. But you still have to do your adhesion samples after that. So uh, in order to gain some perspective when I'm doing, let's, pre-finished metal siding is mostly where you run into this sort of thing. So. What you'll find is that uh, I like to do an adhesion sample before I wash and an adhesion sample after I wash just to see, you know, for my own knowledge, what coatings stick to chalky surfaces. Uh, if I put an additive in there, will it do that? Or do I need to bring it down to this? And is there still adhesion problems even after I uh, get all the chalk off? So there's the, there's the uh, uh, you spray a little chemical on there, you agitate it with brushes, you power wash it off, uh, you let everything dry. And then I do my two test patches, either with a sprayer or a brush or a roller. Uh, usually, uh, reading the specs of the product, uh, if it says it's ready to recoat in one hour, four hours, uh, 16 hours overnight, you come back and do your scratch test then. And the most fail-safe thing that I've found actually in the field is you just take that thumb and you scratch it. If there's no way with normal pressure without hurting your finger that you can get that off, that's going to be a very well-bonded thing. Now, what you can do, too, is the crosshatch test, where you take a razor and you make a checkerboard in there, uh, put some tape over it, burnish the tape and pull it off, and if it starts, you know, because you broke the, the film surface, it, sometimes it can start pull it off. I have found, though, that a lot of times with the tape test, the only thing you pull off is what the razor physically scores, and if it passes the scratch test, I would say it's almost certain that it's going to pass the, the crosshatch test, too. I don't remember one that, that passed one and not the other, so... Um, there is one other thing that I do, uh, you know, I'm sort of a belt suspenders, belt suspenders type of guy, just doing one thing to make sure the coating lasts long usually isn't enough. I like to do more. So even if you wash the chalk off, uh, what you can do is use some emulsibond in the first coat of paint. Now this is a oil water emulsification that you add to water-based paint. Now you have to be very careful with some of the new scientifically advanced uh, industrial coatings that are sort of hybridized. They have some oil water already in them. This is only approved for acrylic, latex, water-based top coats. So just think your standard you know, exterior uh, house paint, things like that. Uh, interesting product, this is an oil water mixture, aids in bonding. You mix a quart of this per gallon, so it's a very, very heavy mixture like this. At that point, it should not really alter the finish a lot. It shouldn't alter the color. Uh, you have to be careful with really glossy paints adding this, though. Uh, so one quart of this to one gallon, uh, pretty steep mixture, only on the first coat. Uh, this is not a suitable top coat. You have to top coat it with just straight paint after that. So uh, that's also something, so you got the thing washed, you got it dry, you've done your adhesion test. If you want a little belt and suspenders, you can do this. Um, 
if your reputation uh, is, is resting on this paint not peeling off metal, wash it and use this. It's tempting to go over and just say, well, this is made for chalky surfaces, so let's do it. But don't ever take that for granted. If you want to do it right, you can also add this in as sort of a fail-safe belt suspender, belt suspender sort of thing. So um, I've also found that a lot of the times picking the right coatings can do a lot. Uh, if you've ever tried 100% acrylic uh, elastomeric house paint on metal, uh, try some DTM, some direct to metals, and also there's some uh, Pro Krill, Sure Krill, sort of advanced, uh, you know, metal systems like that that are supposed to be a little far and above uh, direct to metals that you can use too. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, different coatings in there. And uh, in the old days, it used to be always, you know, let's use a gloss oil, or let's use a satin oil on there because it's hard and it's good for metal, but. If you've ever heard a uh, pole barn or a tin shed or a pre-finished metal building, uh, in the cool morning when that sun comes over, you can hear the tin expanding and contracting. And that's a horrible thing, uh, a horrible sort of mating of surfaces for that brittle oil paint. So a lot of the most technologically advanced metal coatings now have a little bit of uh, give to them, a little bit of elastomeric, uh, elastomeric uh, properties to them. So they, they move with the metal and, and don't break their film. So I hope that helps out here. I'm going to go through some uh, some questions and I apologize. It's about 90 degrees and humid here and uh, every time it does that, my phone dims. So having trouble seeing the questions here. So Russ Perry, thank you so much, sir. Thanks for watching. Nick, Nick Siebold, thanks for watching, my friend. <laughs> Chris Shank, the great and powerful Chris Shank. Thank you so much. That's hard to do live. Tell them. Yeah, I, I saw their uh, saw their handshaking during that. I should tell them that this isn't that important. <laughs> Todd Hill, do you take a picture of the room before moving furniture and pictures? You, most of the guys do. Uh, a lot of the stuff we do is fairly simple. And uh, nowadays, I'm sure you guys have found too that almost everybody works from home or seems to be hanging around the house during the day. So I always just ask them before we leave. What do you need moved? Did you want something adjusted? What can we do for it? you to set you back up in the right place? Make sure the lamps work. Make sure that the uh, uh, internet, cable, TV, everything works like that. And uh, just so we don't get the call back for something unrelated like that. So uh, that's a that's a useful one, Todd. But you know, with these young folks, you know, sometimes they don't follow through with that. So <laughs> PDCA, great job, guys. No, thank you guys very much. Uh, tell the crew that thanks for their willingness to be put on the spot. Very helpful. Yeah, I told them they were fired if they stuttered, so there you go. <laughs> Russ Perry, good job, apprentices. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Genesis, my good friend Genesis. Uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you either at the Craftsmanship Forum or the uh, or the uh, Expo coming up this year. And I've been following Genesis's work on uh, social media and doing excellent, excellent work. So Juliano Alcantara, my good Brazilian friend, South America. All right. Ah, Russ Perry, what's your pressure washer set for for exteriors on a normal project? For that tin project uh, that I have, I have a, uh, uh, I try to find something that I don't have to pull on a trailer, but also is not just a plug-in electric kind of homeowner one. I have a, a fairly substantial uh, Mighty M. It's, it's, it's substantial, but it's not so substantial that I can't pick it up myself and put it in the back of a pickup truck. Uh, even though I get a little older, sometimes it gets a little harder, but uh, you can still pick this up. Uh, I think it goes 38, 3,800 PSI. It's about a three and a half gallon, if I remember, uh, per minute. So I could probably benefit from a higher flow, you know, because most of the most of the people with experience will tell you that if you have to pick either uh, the amount of flow or the PSI, you'd pick flow because it washes better. Uh, I think that's a good medium. I've been using that one for my God, almost 10 years, you know, without any hiccups with it, and everything. It does everything really, really well. So. I have no complaints with that. I think the max pressure is 3,800 psi. I assume after 10 years, it's not producing its max, so it's probably in the in the low 3,000s, give or take. And uh, if done properly, and uh, another thing too, you got to look into is for people who use standard pressure washers or power washers, uh, you have to size the tips, whether they're turbo nozzles, wobble tips. Uh, yellow, green, red soap tips. You have to size those correctly for the flow and the size of the of the pump. So. Uh, if you get a, uh, a nozzle that's too constricted, it's not going to have the performance. If you get one that's built for a higher flow rate, it's, it's just not going to do a whole lot. So the perfect fine-tuned, think of like the fine Italian sports cars. When things are just right, you don't need the biggest engine, you don't need the highest horsepower, you don't need all that, but if everything is fine-tuned, it does exactly what you need. It's mobile, it's useful, and uh, starts on the second pull every spring when I take it out of cold storage. So uh, it's a helpful thing there. So. 
Oh, Kevin Ward. Hello to you too, sir. Felipe, hi from Europe. Well, hello. Thanks for watching, and I appreciate everybody's uh, I appreciate everybody's viewership over the time here. Thank you guys so much. That looks like all the questions. Uh, it's Friday. It's 90 degrees. It's a beautiful fall day. We get to work on one of the most beautiful old homes in Minnesota. We're getting back to work. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any other questions for me, send them here. Uh, get to me through uh, social media, uh, direct message, whatever you like. At the end of October, I'll be doing a master's class for the PDCA's Craftsmanship Forum, so a gathering of the finest craftspeople in the United States, Canada, uh, Mexico, things like that are going to be there, and I'm going to present a master's class uh, titled The Perfect Kitchen on how we enamel cabinets. So, uh, And also, I am preparing for an updated cabinet extravaganza, Ask a Painter. Uh, it's been one of my most popular Ask a Painters in the past. Uh, I try to do it yearly. Uh, and I will go through basically you want to paint your trim in your house you want to paint your cabinets in your house it'll all be there laid out for you I will do a super short concise um, five minute version at the start so people can get it and get out and I'll also expand on it later get some coding science things like that um, it will not be the four hour master's class that I do and I have to keep myself to four hours because there's usually a lot of questions but uh, it will be it will be fairly concise but if you've ever wanted to know anything about painting trim cabinets uh, woodwork things like that it's all there for you as a reference so thanks everybody happy friday and uh, have a good weekend